Hi, and welcome to Freedom Fighters Code Grey. This is a show where we discuss human trafficking, an issue that's taking place locally and globally. In today's episode, I have with me the co-founder and CEO of the Environmental Justice Foundation, Steve Trent. Thanks so much for joining us today, Steve. Hey, pleasure. It's great to be with you. So just to start off with, could you share a bit about what is the Environmental Justice Foundation and what kind of work are you involved in? Yeah, sure. Uh, We set up the Environmental Justice Foundation 20 years ago, specifically to look at environmental abuses and the associated human rights abuses. And put very simply, that can be something like when you scoop out all the fish, what happens to the coastal communities that were dependent on them? When you cut down the trees, what happened to the, the forest dwelling communities that depended on them? But it also goes much wider and much deeper. If you look at the world we live in today in the global economy, um, there are a few simple truths that are very often ignored. And perhaps the biggest of them all is that our global economy depends on a secure environment. That's a simple fact. When you get rid of the fresh water, when you get rid of the natural resources that drive the economy and make the world habitable for you and me, um, you're not left with much else. And stating the obvious, you know, natural resources take on an increasing role in our global economies. You know, they're valuable products. And where you have high value products, you also have people that are perhaps less scrupulous. And what I've seen over 30 years of doing this work now is again and again and again, you have some people who want to maximize profits, minimize costs. And what they often do in that circumstance is use forced bonded or slave labour to reduce their costs and keep their profits up. So with EJF, we look at these issues, we examine them. Critically, we conduct field-based investigations. So we're out there where the problem is happening. And we take our information, a lot of it on film, we specialise the use of film, and we take it to the world's capitals, to the world's decision takers, to the power centres, to articulate the need for change, to present the evidence, and then to ask for change. It's really pretty simple. It's it's very similar to what other organisations like Greenpeace do. Um, But what I've seen is that if you get it right, if you get that information as it's happening, as the abuse is taking place, and if you can show it to the right people, then then often you can get change and positive change. One of the things that you just shared or mentioned as you were talking about environmental impacts was that there's this human impact and you referenced specifically bonded labor. Well, what is labor trafficking? And from your experience and knowledge, who is trafficked around the globe for labor? Okay, well, I, th- I think the best way of explaining this is by giving a simple example of work that we've we've been involved in. Um, in about five, six years ago, we started to look deeply into the Thai seafood trade because that, that market, that seafood product, was entering retailers in North America, in Canada, the United States, across Europe. And in many of the world's wealthy developed economies, you were having product that was produced by companies in Thailand. And when we started looking at it, we found two things, really simple. First thing that we found was that the extent of the fishing was such that it was totally unsustainable. The fisheries were collapsing. There were too many boats scooping out too many fish. And they were just trying to supply that marketplace. And they were doing it for a simple profit. It was out of control, genuinely the Wild West. Now, as the fisheries had begun to decline, and some of them were very close to collapse, you you saw a decline in the catch that you could get for the same fishing effort, if you like. So if a boat went out for a day, it would catch less and less fish. That magnified costs and reduced profits. So what the Thai fishing businesses did at that time was they looked to neighbouring states that had poorer economies, many people that wanted work. And there was a network of unscrupulous brokers and traders who were offering people in Myanmar, in Laos, in Vietnam, superficially good jobs working in bars, working in the tourism sector, working in as, as, uh, other places in hospitality. 
And yet they would be taken in, very often trafficked in, I brought into the country illegally, without documentation, without visas, without being allowed to be there, so no status. And then they would be sold onto fishing vessels because nobody wants to do that work. It's hard, brutal work at sea. And they weren't being paid. And we saw this time and time again, that people coming in from those poor neighbouring states into the Thai economy, which enviably had nearly full employment, shipped onto the boats and they're being forced to work. Some of them working on the same vessel for years before they were allowed to return home or allowed any kind of freedom. And worse than that, in this particular instance, and, and I think this is one of the worst examples that I've seen over my, my 30 years in this business, was that many of the people that were forced onto the boats were subject to really extreme brutality. Um, up to and including murder. And so if you can imagine you've been taken from your home, you're expecting to go to a good job, you were hoping to send back money to your wife, your children, your partner, whoever, and then you find yourself on a boat, isolated, at sea, unable to get to shore for months at end, forced to work very hard. Some of those people, understandably, would, would, would get to a point where they wanted to fight back. And at that point, you saw ship's captain and an enforcer quite literally kill them, throw them overboard, and it was never even heard of. Didn't, no, nobody knew it was happening because it was all at sea. So that's one simple il illustration I can give you of the kind of brutality that can take place in a, in a supply chain. But perhaps the critical point for me and you to understand is much of the product that those slaves were catching was coming to a, a restaurant or a supermarket for you and me. We were eating that product. And you can see this same pattern happening smaller and larger across many different sectors and in many different ways. Um, but if you'll allow me just one other illustration, slightly different. Um, in Thailand, most of the, the, the businesses were independent businesses. They may have had support of local police and local small politicians. And I think many people did know what was going on, but it wasn't state sponsored, if you like. When we looked into Uzbekistan, one of the, the Central Asian republics, um, where they produce some of the world's most valuable cotton for clothing. And if you are, walk into any room in virtually any country in the world, almost everybody will be wearing something that's cotton. You know, this is a, this is a product, a commodity that's traded all over the world. Um, Uzbekistan was exporting to the world. Its product was being mixed everywhere. And when we started to examine what was happening there, not only was there the uh, environmental abuses, so massive excess use of water that drained the Aral Sea, destroyed all 27 native species of fish, left a dust bowl, the overuse of pesticides. We also found that there was a state-sponsored system of forced labour where the state would require school children, teachers, doctors, everybody to go out at harvest time and pick the product. And if you didn't do it, you were in serious trouble. This was a country's government demanding its people work for them, simply so they could maximise the profit, maximise the export value and minimise the cost. Wow, those were two very clear examples that you gave us to help us understand, you know, what does trafficking look like in some of these spaces? Specifically, when you were referencing the fishing industry, what kind of stood out to me is that these industries are exploiting vulnerable people, people who are in impoverished communities with false promises. There's manipulation, there's deception, where they believe they're maybe going to these jobs that are going to help them provide for their family to help them get out of poverty. But they're told a lie. They're placed on these fishing boats where, where they experience violence and brutality. And it's just heartbreaking. Uh, and when you mentioned that, that, you know, there's an onus on us as consumers to be conscious and aware of where our food comes from, where our products come from, and how that um, impacts people around the globe. So I'm just wondering if you could share with me, maybe specifically on, I know your website calls it seafood slavery. What is your organization doing to combat that specific issue? 
the seafood slavery. And I'll, I'll keep this quick and simple because it's very it's easy to get into much detail and it, it, it's not that easily understood. The first thing is you know, meeting at the highest level. So I personally met the senior leadership in Thailand again and again and again to present the evidence, to tell them what was happening. We didn't pull any punches there. We showed them the film. We told, told them about the murder, the abuse, the trafficking. So they couldn't deny it. And I think there's a certain element whereby they felt they had to act. We were also working with the market states. So presenting our evidence to the United States, to countries like Canada, to the European Union, and asking them to leverage their power, the power of their spending, if you like, to require Thailand to take action to eradicate these abuses. And if it's not too abstract, I'll end by saying what we wanted to see was not small bits of change that had no durability, that could be washed away with a new government or a new system. We wanted to change the whole architecture, a system-wide change to bring in transparency that would allow you and me, that would allow a government official, a supermarket buyer, everybody to look into the system see what's going on and be able to judge for themselves if it is okay, if there's the environmental abuse or the human rights abuse. And that still is our overarching goal on many sectors. Give us the transparency and trust in the goodness of people that once they see what's going on, once they know, they will vote with their wallet and they will drive that change through the power of economics. Oh, just what you said is so great. I really appreciate how you broke down. There's kind of a twofold response. We need to address the system level and ensure there's accountability and transparency to help individuals know and acknowledge, okay, this is something that's taking place. What can we do to combat this? But then also once that transparency comes forward, individuals can make better informed choices to understand how their dollars spent are impacting real lives of people around the world. Well, Steve, it has been just such um, an honor to learn from you today and your expertise on this topic. And I'm really excited to continue this discussion after we take a short break. Hi, and welcome back to Freedom Fighters Code Grey, a show where we discuss human trafficking. In today's episode, I have with me co-founder and CEO of the Environmental Justice Foundation, Steve Trent, and we're continuing our discussion on the connection between environmental justice and issues and human rights abuses. So Steve, just to start off with, when people think about protecting the planet, they often think about wildlife and plant life. Why do you and your organization feel that we must also talk about the importance of protecting people in this discussion? Protecting the planet also includes protecting people. Why? I think there's, there's two simple reasons to that. And, and I always want to try and keep this simple. There, there is a, there's a core message that I think can touch everybody's mind and everybody's heart. The first is, that, you know, our global world is the one thing that we all share and we all have a stake in. You know, we need to look after it. It's what it sustains us. It sustains our economies, our social well-being. Everything about us is dependent upon the well-being, the environmental security of our planet. But then when you actually look at you know, how do we keep it secure? How do we maintain biodiversity? How do we protect the ocean, the forests? Well, the first thing that I've come across and that I've learned time and time again is you have to take people with you. You can't do this by command. You've got to bring communities and people, not least those communities that live with the fisheries, with the forests, with the wildlife. You need them to participate and they need to have a voice and a say in how conservation is managed, how we protect our natural world. The second thing that I would say about this, which goes to the very core of our organization's mission, is that you can see when you have a degraded natural environment, you undermine the very basic human rights that we share or that we should be given and sure of. The right to enough drinking water, the right to enough food, the right to enough self-shelter, the right for protection from the storms and, and, and the, the threats that the natural world can throw at you. And, I've been in many places where I've seen the taps go dry. 
and you can see how quickly that erodes everything, all rights. I've been in places where I've seen people starving and you understand the desperation, the frustration, the fear, and on occasion, the anger that that inspires. All of these things come together to undermine human rights, the basic rights to freedom, to a, 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 a survivable world. And then a couple of other dimensions on top of this, if, if, if I can, that may make sense. When people are challenged, when you have a situation whereby parents feel they can't feed their children, they can't feed themselves, there's been a drought, there's been a flood, there's been no harvests for two, three, four years. A few things happen. They may be forced to move, move from their home, the place that they have a spiritual, cultural, historical connection with. They may get angry and they, that may lead to conflict, which in itself can undermine human rights. And I kind of often try to remind people that even in some of the conflicts where there have been other major causes, major problems like in Syria, where you have a humanitarian crisis of, of biblical proportions, it's important to remember that a million people were on the road before a single bullet had been fired there. And they were on the road because of an extended drought that had taken place over more than 10 years that meant that harvest failed, food prices had become completely unsustainable for many families, and it forced them on the road and into conflict with each other. And so I think, for me, this basic truth, environmental security undermines, under, sorry, underwrites and, and, and gives security to our basic human rights. Hmm. You were mentioning you know, kind of a plethora of human rights abuses that can happen as a result of environmental impacts. And as we think specifically of forced labor and child labor, which is one kind of human rights abuses, I'm wondering if you have any examples you could give of how that intersects specifically with environmental concerns or namely one environmental concern. Well, again, you know, the, 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 there's many instances where you can see this happening, where you can see, you know, forced labour and child labour. I mentioned earlier about the Thai fisheries. Um, you can see across many different fisheries around the world. And remember, fisheries are fundamentally important. You know, hundreds of millions of people depend upon them for their food, livelihoods, for the basic income. So this isn't, this isn't a fringe issue. It's one that touches us all in one way or another. And there, you know, we've come across numerous instances where, again, trying to keep costs low, maintain some kind of profit you see children being entered into the market being used as laborers um, working on the fishing boats you can see this I, as i mentioned in the cotton fields of uzbekistan and elsewhere where you see children being used and they're being denied their education and they're being used in the fields to pick the product so all too often people like you and i can have something that's cheap at the end of it. And I think there's one thing that I, I feel very strongly about um, is that many people in the, in the developed world, the Western world, high income economies, don't realize that when they're buying something cheap, it's not actually cheap. Somebody else somewhere is paying the real price. And it'd be that person that's paying the price and it will be the environment and the community that they live in that's paying the price. So this idea that you can have a throwaway culture of endless disposable chief products is really a, a, a colossal lie that needs to be exposed. As we discuss consumerism, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts or ideas for our viewers of how they could be more conscious consumers to help ensure that both the planet and people are being protected as they purchase things. I, th I think it's really important. I, you know, I believe in the power of, 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 of individuals, and I know that it can seem overwhelming in the face of all the many issues that there are and all the different challenges that we face in our lives. But you are powerful. You have a voice. And I say to people, use your vote, use your wallet and demand to understand from your retailers, the businesses that supply you, because they too have a responsibility. Where does your product come from? Can you guarantee to me that it was produced sustainably, legally and ethically, that you've not got slaves in your supply chain, you've not got children producing it? Ask them. They do respond when they get consumers and customers coming to them demanding those truths. 
educate yourselves. I know it's hard, but, you know, look at organisations, look at the information out there, learn from it, and then use your individual power by take, voting with your wallet, demanding responses from the businesses, demanding responses from your government. And that together, when we do come together, when you have many people doing that, can drive a change that can, can really shift the whole system. And I, I, I think that that's, that's profoundly important. That's so good. That's so great. People can make individual choices and take action, right? And, and starting with doing research, learn about businesses and organizations that are, are worthy of support and putting your dollars towards, but then also not just neglecting the organizations that aren't being responsible, but actually taking steps to challenge them and say, hey, I, I think you need to do things differently because I care about protecting the planet and I care about protecting people. That's so great. Now, Steve, I know one of the aspects of environmental justice that your organization focuses on is the climate. Could you just spend some time talking about why should we, as viewers, care about what's happening in our climate today, how it's impacting our world, and how it's impacting each individual person? It's, this is the biggest issue of our time. And one of the challenges that I have is, is talking about it in a way that it doesn't just sound like rhetoric and, and, and scaremongering, because it is so big. It touches us all. And the one thing that is absolutely clear that the science spells out to us without any doubt or hesitation is that failure to control our heating world, failure on climate change will bring failure everywhere. And that means for our economies, for our forests, for our fisheries, for our schools, for our healthcare systems, everything. Because as our world heats up, it will cause such damage that I think we will see mass migrations that have never before been seen in history. And I want to try and explain a few things that are happening now that seem to be hidden from many people. If you look at the six months between September 2020 and March um, 2021, more than 10.3 million people were forced from their homes as a result of climate related events, extreme weather events and, and what's called slow onset, things like desertification. Um, a large proportion of that has happened because our planet is heating up. It's warming up. Now, that kind of displacement is far greater than that that's been caused by, by war and violent conflict. This is a mass migration, a mass movement that is happening here and now in our world that is going, only going to magnify as, we, as, as our planet warms up. If you look into the future, the tragedy of this is, is that most of the migrations and most of the worst impacts are focused on communities and in countries that are the poorest and most vulnerable. And ironically, are those people who have contributed least to heating our planet and benefited least from heating it. So over 90% of climate related deaths happen in developing world economies. Over 90% of those people who are forced to move, move from their homes, leave, happening in developing world economies. Now this will magnify, um, before the start of the industrial revolution, humanity had never seen more than 300 parts per million of carbon in our atmosphere. The UN, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that the safety level was at 350 million parts per level before we had to really start worrying. 400 million parts per million has been swept away. And as I speak now, we're over 414 parts per million. Now, that's quite an abstract thing. What does this mean? And people often look at it and say, well, half a degrees increase, one degree increase, two degrees increase. Um, if I can try and make sense of this by saying atmospheric carbon is now at a level that has not been seen in the last three million years when sea levels were 60 feet, 18 metres higher than they are now. We can witness now our polar ice caps are melting and as they melt, sea levels are rising. So if you're in a low level country like Bangladesh, 
tens of millions of people are literally going to be forced from their their homes by flooding, inundation of salt water. And that will happen across the world. It won't just be in poor countries. Major cities like New York are at risk from flooding. Major cities like London are at risk from flooding. Unless we control this and contain it, we will see this huge disruption in humanity and that will erode and undermine all our basic rights. And if I um, can say one last thing on this, um, environmental conservation, action on climate change is often presented as a cost. This is the biggest mistake of all time, actually, Acting today, acting now would be the biggest cost saving of all history, because if we can roll it back now, it will be a lot easier than waiting another five years, 10 years, 20 years. If we let it go to that stage, we may see uncontrollable runaway climate change, global heating, and it will prove disastrous for the global community. Steve, really quickly, where can viewers get more information about the work that you're doing and find ways to get involved to help combat you know, climate change and human rights abuses? All, all of these things. You can find out most of what you need to know from our website, which is www.ejfoundation.org. If you look on there, there's, there's ways in which you can get involved, reports and films, simple short films that you can view that tell you everything you need to know. And we want to work collaboratively. So we support other organisations, community organisations around the world in poor countries, work with big organisations like WWF and Greenpeace, we, we want to be um, just not our own voice, but a voice that shares your voice and a global community's voice to drive change. That, that's the key message that I have today at the end of this. Well, Steve, thank you so much to you and your organization and all the people that you're working with for the incredibly important work that you're doing to protect people and to protect the planet and to ensure that there is environmental security and your advocacy for that as a human right. If you're tuning into the show today and you've experienced trafficking in Canada and you are in need of immediate assistance and you're in danger, please call 911 if it's safe to do so. Otherwise, call our 24-7 hotline for information and support at 1-833-900-1010. Again, that's 1-833-900-1010. Thanks so much for tuning in to Freedom Fighters Code Grey and we hope to catch you next time.